On the cutting edge of the new mainstream, Christine Upchurch is passionate about bringing together science, psychology, and spirituality in a way that can be applied to our everyday lives for true transformation. The Christine Upchurch Show, stellar conversations to illuminate your journey, engages some of the most inspired visionaries on the planet in lighthearted, lively dialogue. Join us as we explore the expansive nature of reality in a down-to-earth way, offering you insights and tools, empowering you to become that bright light you're meant to be. Now, here's your host, Christine Upchurch. Hello, everybody. Welcome. So glad you're joining us here today, whether you're listening live here in the Seattle area on 1150 AM KKNW in Connecticut, Rhode Island, or New York on WBLQ AM 1230 radio on one of the 35 stations in Australia or anywhere around the world. I tell you, if you're listening live, you're going to be glad you joined us. If you're listening in the archives on christineupchurch.com, you're going to be thrilled you joined us because we have an amazing guest. I am so excited. But before we get into that and, and you know, get going with the show, I want to first say hello to Benny, who makes this, you know, all happen with his technological magic across the, the counter here. Hello, Benny. <laughs> across the counter, across the board. Yeah, yeah. It all yeah. works either way. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you back, Christine. I, for, I personally don't want to waste any more time either about me. Huge show today. Huge yes, show. Huge show and oh, huge news. Oh, yes. my goodness. Louise Hayes passing. Um, huh. She has made such a difference on this planet. And I have to tell you, for me personally, back in the late 1980s, when I was facing the early stages of cancer and doctors had nothing to offer me, except ultimately per- perpetual weekly chemotherapy for the rest of my life, I was looking for an alternative. And Louise Hay's first book was one of the few books out there that helped me discover the mind-body connection. And through her work, she also helped me to discover how much... I didn't love myself, and it was transformational for me. I will be forever grateful for for that, as well as all the authors that she has brought forward through Hay House. Louise, wherever you're at, um, we feel your light still, and God bless you. And uh, I'm I'm so grateful that she was on this planet because she made a huge difference. Now, our guest today has also made a huge difference on this planet, and she's still going strong. We are talking about Dr. Jean Houston, and today we are going to be talking about birthing a new humanity. Boy, something we really need to do. Now, you probably all know Jean Houston, but let me go through just a few of her accomplishments. First of all, she is a scholar, a philosopher, a researcher in human capacities, and is one of the foremost visionary thinkers and doers of our current time. And she is long regarded as one of the principal founders of the human potential movement, and for very good reason. Uh, She founded the Foundation of Mind Research 36 years ago with her husband, Dr. Robert Masters. And she's the founder and principal teacher of the Mystery School. She's a prolific writer. Oh, my goodness. I think that it's up to 25 published books, including A Passion for the Possible, The Possible Human. And her latest book is The Wizard of Us, Transformational Lessons from Oz. She speaks all over the world. She does seminars with social leaders, educational institutions, business organizations, um, and she's worked intensively in 40 different cultures, helping to enhance and deepen their uniqueness while they become a part of the global community. And we really do need that global community. And she is with us here today, Dr. Jean Houston. Jean, welcome to the Christine Upchurch Show. Thank you. It's what a pleasure to be with you. You know, <laughs> by the way, it's 35 books now, but who's 35. Counting? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my. They told me 25. And I tell I you, know, you, you have I, an old script. I'll have to remind my office. To <laughs> that script is 20 years old. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, you know, I have to tell you that um, I haven't read all 35. I have to admit I have read some, but Neither not all 35. I. I never read my books after I finish them. <laughs> I, that's all I want. I just want to see them again. So you're way ahead of me. You no, know, it's, it's a different type of birthing, isn't it? When you're it writing a book. Yeah. And I know that your passion right now is is helping us to transition to something more. Can you please sort of share with our listeners what your perspective is on this, you know, what's going on? I mean, we're, we're looking at, at all sorts of chaos from this, you know, chaos in the political arena to flooding in various places around the world, including down in Houston, yeah. um, to, you know, all, all sorts of dysfunction at a time when many of us are feeling very passionate about creating positive 
loving, cooperative, mm-hmm. um, you know, global community. What What's going on right now? Well, what's going on is the inevitable breakdown before the, the sacred breakthrough. And it is oh. true. We're in a time in which everything is changing. It's whole system transition. You cannot look at any place or anywhere without seeing that everything is essentially disintegrating and trying to come uh, back together again. Uh, a poet once said, "'Tis all in pieces, all coherence gone, all just supply, all relation. The element of fire is quite put out." And that was in 1611 with John Donne. Wow. And then, then you have others who also speak about, you know, that uh, the best lack all conviction and the worst are filled with passionate intensity. Well, I have to disagree with that. Uh, yes, 40 cultures, but I've also worked or taught in 109 countries oh you know, over the last 60 years or so. Wow. And I have to tell you that there is another story that is going on that is much, much larger. And that is people rising up to say no, people protesting, uh-huh. people really exploring the, the outer reaches of inner space, tapping into the genius that is the human condition and discovering that you know, that we're at a time when the real work of humanity begins. Mm-hmm. This is the time where we, we partner creation in the recreation of ourselves, uh, in the restoration of the biosphere, in the assuming of a new kind of culture. We might call it a culture of kindness, mm-hmm. where, where we live daily life in such a way as to be reconnected and charged and made more intelligent by the source of our reality. We're becoming, I think, liberated in our inventiveness, very engaged in our world and past. And there's reasons why this has happened. One is the breakdown of things that are not only hundreds of years old or ways of being, but mm-hmm. thousands of years old. Right. So we are in the most interesting time in human history. Other times thought they were, if they're wrong, this is it. Right. And I'm fascinated by um, one of the phrases, and I think it was the first poem you referred to, about the, the breakdown of all coherence or something along those lines. Yes, that was John Donne, 1611, yeah. yeah. So, you know... That was because we discovered that the Earth was not at the center. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> that, yes. The, the, new, the new cosmology, and also it's the new cosmology mm-hmm. that's also bringing radical new understanding. We now know that we don't simply live in the universe. Uh-huh. The universe lives in us. Right. That we have both finite and infinite natures. And a lot of my recent work is really looking at daily life in the quantum universe. What does it mean to really know that you are the universe in miniature, Uh you know, dressed up in a biodegradable space, you know, space time suit. But (laughs) but within that power and package, which I've spent my lifetime exploring, Uh there are so many new potentials that have risen up, that are rising up worldwide to be able to cause us to be able to be not just adequate stewards of this time and place, but also tap into the dimensions of the human capacity that hitherto we did not explore. Right. And I know that in, in, in healing, we talk about sort of getting into coherence. So it sounds to me like you're, you're you know, quoting somebody from 1611 about the breakdown of coherence. Yes. And with your vision of, of our transition right now, that we're ultimately going to go to some sort of you know, new kind of coherence. How do you envision that, that, where we're headed? Well, I think, you know, there is everywhere that I go, and my, my one claim to fame is I'm one of the best-traveled human beings who's ever lived. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know? One of your many claims to fame. Well, no, this is, no, this is it. This is it. That and, I'm, and I, I know how to talk to dogs, but, and I'm uh-huh. a decent cook. That's it. <laughs> but, but I find it all over, Christine, that there is a quickening an incredible sense of a need for the possible human in us all to help create the possible society, the possible world, uh-huh. uh, if we're going to survive our own personal and planetary odyssey. Right. I, and, uh, th- and I can give many, many examples of how this is happening all over the world. But one of the main reasons for it is the rise of women. It's probably it's the main yes, one. Yes. The rise of women to full partnership with men in the whole domain of human affairs with terrible backlash, no question of about course, it. How do you yes. change the rules of thousands of years, you know, mm-hmm. within a few, very few years. Right. But with women, where the emphasis is on process rather than on product, on making things cohere, develop, grow, on, on, uh, on their own inner growth. I mean, when you go to all these seminars, as you of all people certainly have noticed, 
uh, the the larger percentage is women, yes, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yes. Even those seminars which are led by men, men. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's fascinating. And you know, from my perspective, we're also beginning to to, to integrate what I consider to be the divine feminine, which yes. is is very different. So it makes sense that the the females who are more open and um, competent, sort of processing that would be the mm-hmm. ones bringing this forward. Yes. You know, when I was 16, I was president of my high school uh-huh. in New York City. Uh-huh. And Mrs. Roosevelt had just left the United Nations. She just retired. And she was gathering all of us, you know, high school presidents, to talk about international work and the UN. And she said that the great task of our time was making human rights matter and also to re think our human capacities, our human destiny. Uh-huh. And, you know, she also spoke to us individually in words that were ones with a kind of pungent language that sparked our spirits as it called forth a whole new sense of purpose. And it was those conversations that I had with her that got me going on my path. Wow. And I remember she said things like, we have to face the fact that either we're all going to die together or we're going to have to live together. (laughs) And if we're going to live together, we have to talk. Uh And she said it was the most important time in human history. Now, this is what year. This would be 1954, I guess. Wow. And she asked us to consider working in some way with the U.N. She said it was going to be thankless work. And we said, oh, we don't like the idea of being underappreciated. She said, Mm -hmm. no one can make you feel inferior without your your consent. But then she would add, when will our consciousness go so tender that we'll act to prevent human misery rather than avenge it? And then she looked at me one day and she said, My dear, I'd rather suspect you're going to have a most interesting career. <laughs> but remember, my dear, as a professional woman, you can expect to be trashed. She didn't use the word trash, but something sure. like that. Right, but right. then she said, but remember too, my dear, a woman is like a tea bag. You put her in hot water and she just gets stronger. <laughs> As you and I have both oh, yes. probably found out. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but I think this is happening. The rise of women too is is you know, is creating chaos and it is creating wonder. Uh-huh. And uh, well, you know, one half of the human race, it's genius, it's ebullience, it's it's different perspectives is right. is really uh, coming into time with backlash, yes. yes. But th- th- this is making all the difference. Yes. And I think that um, we have transitioned recently from sort of pushing against the masculine to um, being proponents of the traditional feminine and stand, stepping forward in, uh, as whole women as opposed to, um, you know, trying to be the facade of, you know, sort of put on the, the male facade and, and mm-hmm. um, bring the masculine energy forth. So I think we, we're at this important transition now as well. Very much so. We have to go to a quick break, but when we return, um, more with the wonderful Jean Houston. Stay tuned. Chris Stainis is a spiritual leader and healer and teaches a course on how you can transform your life through a meditation and healing system that will manifest your spirit's dreams. She manifested the Women of Wisdom Conference, the Women of Wisdom book, and this radio show. And she can show you how to change your life, too. Are you ready? Visit the website and contact her at VoicesOfWomenToday.com. That's VoicesOfWomenToday.com. What is a brilliant culture? And how do we create them? Why are they important? Claudette Rowley has created a breakthrough five-step process to help you design a culture that is authentic, innovative, and successful. Learn how to create change with Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence, and Claudette Rowley. To learn more or work with Claudette, visit ClaudetteRowley.com. The goal for the Art of Powerful Living Radio is to inspire every human to live lives that are rich, fulfilling, on purpose, and fun. This hit show with Robert Schoenfeld is a fresh approach to boldly living our lives with creativity, courage, patience, wisdom, 
love, and power. Join Robert every month with Dr. Pat Basili for the Art of Powerful Living Radio. On the cutting edge of the new mainstream, Christine Upchurch is passionate about bringing together science, psychology, and spirituality in a way that can be applied to our everyday lives for true transformation. The Christine Upchurch Show, stellar conversations to illuminate your journey, engages some of the most outstanding visionaries on the planet in lively dialogue to inspire you to become that bright light you're meant to be. Join Christine every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time on KKNW, AM 1150, and Transformation Time. Talk Radio. I'm Christine Upchurch, and this is a Stellar Reflections Minute. For centuries, spiritual traditions have talked about how humans have an energy field, or aura, surrounding them. Although skeptical scientists refuted this for decades, science is now beginning to catch up with spirituality. Scientists can actually measure light emanating from living beings, so they can measure the human aura, which in scientific terms is known as the biofield. Many medical practitioners around the world use an instrument to evaluate a patient's biofield for the purpose of diagnosing illness. They understand that imbalanced or insufficient light in a person's energy field indicates a physical or emotional problem. The good news? There are ways to balance and increase your light, resulting in greater well-being. For more information, please check out StellarReflections.com or call 425-999-9836. That's 425-999-9836. Welcome back to the Christine Eptrich Show here on KKNW, WBLQ, and Transformation Talk Radio. You know, Jean, um, I'm really excited about the change underway, and I have to tell you... um, I've been a little frustrated because I think that oh, probably five to seven years ago, I felt like the mission that the IMA you know, played my small role on was, was moving forward in a, a very energetic way. It felt like we had figured out a lot about manifesting towards our goals. And I don't know, something has happened in the last couple of years that has kind of upset the apple cart, so to speak, for many people who have been on their paths who feel like they had it all worked out before and now their lives are in turmoil. They're, they're feeling like they, you know, they don't know how to show up. What's your perspective on what's been happening the last couple of years? Well, we're in the hero and heroine's journey. You know, you're describing years in which we felt ourselves called going forward. We found our allies and suddenly we were going to really cross into the realm, as you remember in the story of the hero's journey, the realm of adventures, the realm of amplified power, and we get stuck. Uh-huh. We get stuck by the guardian at the gate. <laughs> you think you're going forward. You think you have the wherewithal to do it. No, you got to get past me. Uh-huh. you got to get past the fears and the phobias and the inertia and living a life of serial monotony and same old, same old. You know, are you, you really have to, it's not a question of toughening, it's a question of deepening, and that's why you then fall into, remember in the story, the belly of the whale, mm-hmm. where you, you really are in the time of recreation and regeneration. And we realize it, and, and also really being there for each other, it's a matter of community now. It isn't just simply about one's, oneself and one's growth. Right. It's also, I think of the poet Rilke, who said, um, see if I can remember, we must assume our existence as broadly as we in any way can. Everything, even the unheard of, must be possible in it. This is at bottom the only courage that is demanded of us to have courage for the most strange, the most inexplicable. So I think, I think Christine, this is not a time to close down mm-hmm. or live in fear, but rather to come together, to deepen, to discern, to discover Yes. It's new levels and realms of possibility, even the unheard of. And that this means, among other things, that we can't be lazy. Right. We have to open our bodies, our minds, our creative imagination, individually and collectively, beyond all previous understanding. Right. We have to learn to make that vision a reality. We must pour our, our, our deepest passion into the passionate, incredible, 
incredible opening moment, but the opening moment rarely happens in in a time of just, you know, same old, same old, or mm-hmm. everything is ordered and sweet. Right. It always tends to happen if you look at it historically in times like this, because it is then that you wake up. It's then you become a generative force. It's then you really become part of the new story. Mm-hmm. We were not in the new story. We were in a kind of sweet ending of what we thought was the old story. Mm. But now it is upon us, and it always bursts on with fireworks, which is where we are now. Right. Um, And and, and, and that's a a beautiful um, uh, image, the the fireworks, because it it feels very much that that's what's going on. And um, in terms of the collective, it feels like that many within the consciousness movement have thought in terms of needing to keep it um, positive and light, and yet we're facing a deep collective heartbreak about things not being as we wish them to be, things not being as we desire on our missions to create. And so um, I think that many of us have been stuck with this notion of, okay, we had these tools from, um, you know, the the end of this previous age, Mm -hmm. How do how are we supposed to get out, out into the community? How are we supposed to take it from our deepening as as the universe is forcing us to go deeper and deeper, but bringing it outward to the world? Well, you know, I'm as you say that I'm thinking of the time of apparent closing down in nature, and that would be the uh, the caterpillar. Uh-huh. The caterpillar is pretty happy. It goes through life, yum 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 yum, eat eat eat, munch munch uh-huh. munch, destroy the leaves, nom nom nom. And it gets pretty fat. Uh-huh, <laughs> That's right. what we were. And then that fatness encloses as a shell, doesn't it? The cocoon. Yes. Now, in the cocoon, you think, oh, there's going to be magic. No. Everything becomes mush. It's where mm-hmm. we are. We're in the cocoon stage. Right. Everything is mush. And, and you would never know that out of that mush is going to come the butterfly. Uh-huh. And after a while, in that deepening state of the mush, we're different kinds of what are called imaginal cells. Those are the creative cells that hold the basis for the new butterfly. One sort of signals the other, hello there, I got a piece of the wing. Well, I got the other foot. You know, and mm-hmm. it's not quite like that, but it's pretty close. <laughs> and this, oh, this, but this butterfly, out of the mush, using the mush, the energy that it has learned from its breakdown, it begins to put it back together again until finally the butterfly emerges so different from the, the 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 caterpillar, it lives lightly on the earth. It goes from place to place. It pollinates. It's a thing of beauty. Uh-huh. I think we are in the mush stage, but we are also at the stage of finding our resources, our resonances, our design for the new ways of being. What does the possible society really look like? Uh-huh. What does the possible human look like? We feel it in our bones. It rises. In, it, it rises in us, especially in the morning or late at night, depending on whether you're a lark or an owl. You know? uh, right, right. Yeah. And uh, th- this is where I find, I, I'm finding that conversations uh, are deeper, mm-hmm. and not just deeper, but people are gathering in clusters literally all over. And I say, because of the nature of my life, I'm in a position to see it sure. happening everywhere. I've had the... I, I was telling, telling you before in the break that I did. I crossed Canada with my friend for my 80th birthday, uh-huh. and this lovely country. But everywhere I went, not only first, first whether you were with native native peoples or whether you were with engineers or housewives, they all said the same thing. Poor you, an American. Poor, we feel uh-huh. such sympathy for you. Right, first yes. we got to the sympathy, but then when we got past it, when we got past it. They would talk to us about what they were planning, what they were doing, how they were co-creating, how they were envisioning the new society. Of course, they have a very great, uh, you know, leader and yes, Justin they do. Trudeau, yeah. I mean, you know, somebody who's profoundly done his human homework. And it was really, it was always the question of doing your human homework, but doing it together in community, because I find that people work together in community with without ego but with a passion for the possible things happen. Mm-hmm. I've been reading just now a book that is not out yet. It won't be out till the fall. And it is by the great Lynn McTaggart. Oh, love wrote, her. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not supposed to say very much about it, but it's called The Power of Eight. Uh-huh. And in the book of Power of Eight, she has organized many, 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 many groups of eight. 
who are working on healing or making whole. Uh And so they hold the thoughts together for days of of, uh, the healing of an individual or the healing of of a thing. And not only does incredible, statistically remarkable amounts of healing take place with the people that they're thinking or praying about, Mm -hmm. but they themselves in these groups of eight begin to, uh, they all become uh, spiritually empowered. That's the only word I could say. Mm -hmm. Ecstatic. uh, Filled with a whole new sense of understanding of what reality is like, of purpose, of creativity. Because they have entered together, like in the cocoon, they have entered into a state of a different affinity in which they're doing something. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's prayer, but it then tends to lead to them taking action beyond that. I'm not allowed to speak more about it because the book's going to come out very, very, well, very, very soon, so she's asked me not to. But Uh I can at least tell you that when, as these groups begin to form, and I'm I'm actually working with an incredible group of people whose names you might, some of them you would know, who are, we are looking at what would a new form of intensive communion, communication, spirituality really look like? Mm-hmm. Because we need the deeper kinds of, of sources and resources right. that are ready to come out now and heal the world. And these groups are forming everywhere. Yeah. So this is something that I'm seeing, again, all over the world happening. And, and that's very exciting. And as you were describing before, it sounds to me like an important part of this process is in order for us to turn into that butterfly, we each have to contribute a, a piece of the transformation within that cocoon so that we can be the complete butterfly. And without that connection, um, it, it might not happen. Well, your program. I mean, how long have you been doing this program for? Uh, about five years now, I think. How many? Five years, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. But think of how many people that you have uplifted and how they have then taken some of the words spoken on this program and they have then gone out and they have gone out. Yes. I mean, it really comes if you just do the al- just the sheer algorithm of it. Yes. It is millions of people and with it hundreds of thousands of actions, you see. Uh-huh. So when you go home and you think, oh boy, another hard day, and I don't know, you no, know, it, it 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 isn't true, is it? No, and and I tell you, when when we work our passion, whether it's been when I've been doing energy healing or teaching or doing the radio show or writing a blog, it's like it's it's not a s- stressful thing. It's joyful, it and is joyful. and yeah. I I hope that the joy that you know that we're experiencing this conversation that we're experiencing sharing our perspectives has this ripple effect as well because um, we're supposed to be joyful when we work. Very much so. We have to go to another quick break, but when we return, for those of you in the Seattle area or, you know, in driving distance to Seattle or want to get on a plane and come to Seattle, Jean's going to be here um, on the 15th, 16th, and 17th of, of September this month. Happy September, everybody. Stay tuned for more. What show over you? I'm Christine Upchurch, and this is a Stellar Reflections Minute. What does the word healing mean? Many think that healing merely means eliminating symptoms. However, based on my many years as a healer, I have a much broader perspective on the word. Healing can manifest in a variety of ways, including having physical problems resolved, becoming more emotionally centered, experiencing better relationships, gaining greater clarity, and feeling more spiritually connected. True healing always includes some level of transformation. Whatever form healing takes, there is one commonality, an improvement in quality of life. To me, the highest form of healing goes beyond aligning with wellness. It comes from recognizing our soul's voice and allowing it to speak through us. And in that sense, don't we all yearn to heal into our wholeness? Please visit StellarReflections.com or call 425-999-9836. That's 425-999-9836. Hi there. My name is Audrey Michelle, host of Rewired Life Radio and a spiritual growth coach. I talk about this all the time on my show, listening to your body and acting on intuition. What do these things even mean? Here's the thing. About 10 years ago, I figured out I was doing it all wrong. I mean, I wasn't unhappy, but was I really happy? 
And then life sent me a spiritual smackdown, like it does, because I wasn't listening to my best resource, my body and my intuition. I was living from a place of fear. I was stressed and I was in pain, and I seemed to be happily unhappy. Mostly I just didn't know what I didn't know. And what I didn't know was that my body and my intuition had all the tools I needed to live life as my best self. I'm sharing the tools I have learned over the last 10 years of my healing journey in my online class, Soul Awakening, beginning September 19th. Learn more. Go to AudreyMichelle.com slash awaken. That's Audrey Michelle spelled M-I-C-H-E-L dot com slash awaken. Have you been seeing numbers like 111 and 222 everywhere you go? Do you feel that the universe may be trying to get your attention, perhaps offering a message of some sort? As it turns out, numerical patterns and certain types of geometry form the very fabric of our reality, from cells under a microscope to the astronomy of our night sky. At Stellar Reflections, we offer special sessions which tap into these patterns, designed specifically to support you on your journey. The 111 and 222 activations are sessions activating new patterns in your energy field, which in turn can help you create new patterns in your life. After just one session with a practitioner, either in person or via distance, clients report gaining greater clarity, becoming more intuitive, and honoring their inner truth as they move forward in their lives. Curious about what these transformational sessions might do for you? Call 425-999-9836 or visit StellarReflections.com. That's StellarReflections.com. Welcome back to the Christine Upchurch Show here on KKNW and, of course, Transformation Talk Radio. I'm having a wonderful conversation today with Dr. Jean Houston. And, Jean, you are coming to Seattle, and I'm really grateful because, you know, it's, it's, it's my local city here. Um, do you want to share a little bit about what you're going to be presenting here in Seattle at the Center for Spiritual Living? September 15th is the evening program, and then the weekend program, the 16th and 17th. Well, part of it is certainly about how do we actually create the butterfly. Uh-huh, <laughs> Not right. so much. How do we envision and, and practically create the new human being that is always there beneath the surface crust of consciousness. And we'll also look about the you know holy darkness and holy light. People often think of light and darkness as antithetical qualities, and that's not true at all. Ooh, it's ooh. often out of the time of darkness, of apparent darkness, that the greatest human capacities, ideas, energies, arts emerge, and how to tap into both light and darkness in such a way that this can be so in your own life. So I'll be doing seminars on, on those kinds of things as well. But it's, uh, it, it's really around the theme of given the incredible shifts and changes of our time and how this is calling forth shifts and changes and new capacities in our own human uh, everydayness and how to uh, how to find them how to discover them how to work with them and thus experience being part being the change maker the game changer in your own life both in the way you are you explore your own human enormous capacities and how do you bring them into your own life and time wow. wherever you are and you know, Jean, I have to tell you, I am fascinated by this concept of embracing the darkness. Can you tell, say a little bit more about that? About the darkness? The darkness, the, the power that comes from the darkness. Well, the darkness, remember that we are 96% invisible. <laughs> oh, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> the universe is 96% dark matter or mm. dark energy. And it's only 4% that is visible. And this means since we are don't just live in the universe, but the universe lives in us. Uh-huh. A great deal of us is unconscious, is untapped, is is living in the cocoon, you know, right. so to speak. But then how do we then really access this measure of light that is being shielded and protected in the darkness of our time until we are ready? And by God, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready. Oh, yes. I mean, this is the time oh. of grow or die, evolve or perish. I mean, if we don't do it, well, you know, we'll still be around in 200 years. There might be a million and a half of us around. We will look awful. 
<laughs> and, and we'll be tripping over abandoned electronic appliances. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is that incredible time. So we are the one who right now in our lives now in the 21st century, we're the ones who have the most profound task in human history, the task of deciding whether we grow or die. And so in, with ourselves, it means tapping into the vast potentials that we have been avoiding because we got too comfortable or because we just didn't pay attention. Mm -hmm. But then on the cultural level, it's the task of helping cultures and organizations to move from, from dominance by one economic culture or group to circular investedness, sharing, partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, it, talking about economics, it will involve putting economics back as a satellite to the soul of culture rather than, than having the soul of culture as a satellite to economics. Right. And it will involve listening past the arias and habits of cruelty of crushed and humiliated people. Mm -hmm. It will involve, a, what should I say, a, a stride of soul that will challenge the very canons of our human condition. I mean, it will it require that we become evolutionary partners with each other. I mean, mm -hmm. we have an opportunity to play a role in the greatest transition drama that the world has ever seen. Mm -hmm. the, the, the time we are in right now may be the great either or of history. We're the, we're the people of the parenthesis. We're at the end of one era and not quite at the beginning of the new one. Mm -hmm. And sure, some withdraw from the onslaught. Some live, and this is my big issue, some live removed. Some right. become workaholics. Uh -huh. Some find numbing solace in it. And addictions are our staring at not just television, but now living in screens sure. oh, yeah. <laughs> and not seek each other. I'll never forget over uh, some weeks ago, I saw two, a young man and woman clearly having a date, you know, uh, right. but they were just talking to each other on their iPhones. Oh, <laughs> they were two feet apart from each other, oh, you goodness. know, but many, I think in many of the people who are listening to this program now, a significant number are trying to understand the momentous opportunity that is ours. Yeah. That we are, in fact, are the most important people who have ever lived, because we're the ones who determine whether humankind will grow or die, evolve right. or perish. Right, and it's terrifying, so, and it and it's also inspiring. So, I, I my my question, and that's something I'm going to deal with: How do we prepare ourselves? How do mm -hmm. we tap into these capacities? Right. The capacities for visioning, the tap into, the capacities for really entering into the imaginal zones that right now are in darkness, but when you tap into them, they get so, we burst with light. Uh -huh. You know, what qualities of mind, body, spirit can overcome the limitations we feel? How do we go about preparing ourselves to become stewards of our time, stewards of the planet? Mm -hmm. I mean, filled with enough passion for the possible to partner one another through the greatest social and physical transformation ever seen. I love and that. Passion choice, for the possible. Yes. yes. You know, um, integral to all this that you're saying, you're, you're talking about the darkness, and through religion, through culture, we have been taught, we have it's probably programmed in our DNA to push against the darkness, to avoid the darkness, to fear the darkness. How, on an individual level, do we get beyond that? Well, on an individual level, you really regard the gar the, the, that the darkness is the great crucible, the great cave that is holding our light until we say, okay, we're ready. We have to go forward. And then out of the darkness emerges, both in spiritual experience as well as in human experience at all levels, emerges the dazzling light, the dazzling light. And it seems inherent in this that, how do I put this? It, it can't be going into darkness for the, the purpose of getting to the light, but that there, there's an aspect of having to um, accept it for what it is. Um, well, we have to give, give up thinking that the darkness is evil. Yes, it isn't. Yes. You know, beneath the surface crust of consciousness lies the darkness, and in the darkness is the universe, and in the universe is us. So one of the things that I do is, I take some of the things that you've thought of as darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you a very simple one. Not having enough time. Right. Okay? Uh -huh. That's the big yep. one. All right. Uh, but when you really go into the realm of time, and there's something I'll teach people how to do, you find that you can. time is not our enemy. 
It's just that we haven't looked at it appropriately. Thus, we will show you to take two or three minutes of clock time that can be equal subjectively to many hours and wow. do in a few minutes what would normally take you hours. I do this all the time. Oh, this gives me chills. You see, that, that, would, be, that would be an example. Uh-huh. In, in the darkness, seemingly, is hidden you know, the creative potential. And yet when we learn to tap into what we thought of as darkness, into the inner reaches of outer space or the outer reaches of inner space, then we find that there is enormous imagination, vision, potentials that are just wanting us to be to redream the dream, redeem, redeem the, the unread vision of the higher dream that is there, you know, just knocking at the corners of our minds saying, we're here, we're here, please see us. And how do you learn how to see this kind of thing? Mm-hmm. Similarly, we look with remorse at the past, the things that yes. we did not do or that we could have done or how we, uh, we did not really discover the, the depth of what we contained. And it may be a past event. It may be a very small event. I'll give you a very small event. So somebody was talking to me about it the other day. So this is a person who had always wanted to be an artist. But back in the third grade, Mrs. Toadface Horror <laughs> went by as you were doing your drawing and saying, Oh, child, you have absolutely no potential at all. Give that up. Oh, dear. Instead of saying, Oh, uh, a house that looks like a fat person. What a wonderful idea. Such creativity. <laughs> right. Oh, yes. Keep at it. We can actually change and shift the past. And you might say, it's, it's shifting a memory. It's more than that we're uh-huh. beginning to discover. Right. And then this this is it. This, this, you want to shiver. <laughs> this is where yes. I will have a person shift an event. They will live it out in a new way. Not a major trauma, but a minor event like uh-huh. what I just described. Right. And live it out in such a way that it becomes so real. And they can do it in about 10 minutes. They actually shift, go through the, the curtains of time. And they are able to enter into time past and recreate it in such a way that it becomes real. Mm-hmm. And then what happens, not in every case, but in a lot of them, is people who were present for the event begin to re-remember it in mm-hmm. the way uh-huh. that it has been shifted in you. Yes, And, and that... it has a huge effect on your presence. And this is fascinating, and it it brings up some other questions. But, you know, we have to go to another quick break. Boy, you don't want to miss this this last segment. Stay tuned for more with Dr. Jean Houston. Calling all moms, it's time to awaken your vibrant, intuitive, loving self in every area of your life. Join host Debbie Pokornik as she shares thoughts, stories, and tools to help you stand in your power. Listen to Vibrant Powerful Moms Helping Everyday Women Create Extraordinary Lives, Mondays at 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern. For more information about Debbie, visit empoweringenergy.com. That's empowering with letters N-R-G.com. I'm Christine Upchurch, and this is a Stellar Reflections Minute. As a former research statistician, my scientific background is what many would call sensible. For more than a decade now, I have been working in the field of energy medicine, facilitating sessions and teaching around the world. People from the mainstream often ask me, how did a sensible woman like you end up working in such an alternative field? Implicit in their question is the underlying assumption that the field of subtle energy, such as energy healing and intuition, isn't sensible. But I believe it is very sensible. Even scientists are able to measure aspects of this. Approaching life from an energetic perspective brings us new opportunity for healing and transformation. And from a practical standpoint, even if you can't rationally explain how something works, if you experience a shift from it, then doesn't it make it pretty sensible? Please visit StellarReflections.com or call 425-999-9836. That's 425-999-9836. Wow. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. This is Talk Radio to Thrive By. I'm telling you, I got to pinch myself some days because when each of us gets called to do something that we so not thought was in our wheelhouse to do for a purpose that's so much greater than us, we get to show up and shine. If you would like to show up and shine on the Dr. Pat Show as a co-host or sponsor, send us an email to inspire at the drpatshow.com. Is traditional medicine not working for you? Do you still feel as if your health isn't 100%? 
Here at the Holistic Medical Center, Dr. Nushin Darvish and the qualified staff look through the dimensions of wellness and start a healing plan prioritized to your needs. Our physicians assess the whole you until complete health is achieved. Get the help you need by visiting drdarvish.com or call 425-451-0404. Are you stuck in unhealthy habits, toxic relationships, or low self-esteem? Do you crave a life of inspiration, love, self-acceptance, and fun? Sounds like you're on the verge, on the verge to your next big thing. Join Laura Richer, host of On The Verge Radio, helping you use your breakdown for a breakthrough, overcome life's greatest challenges, and live the life you want and deserve. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio or visit seattlehealinghypnosis.com for more information. Welcome back to the Christine Upchurch Show here in KKNW and Transformation Talk Radio. Oh boy, oh boy. I'm having such a great time on air and off with Dr. Jean Houston. And again, she is coming to Seattle. And before we run out of time, I want to reiterate that she will be at the Center for Spiritual Living um, on Sandpoint Way in Seattle, September 15th and Friday, which is a Friday night, 7 to 9, Birth in a New Humanity, and um, September 16th and 17th at the Center for Spiritual Living. Uh, bringing the holy to life the entire weekend. And you can get tickets through spiritualliving.org or through eastwestbookshop.com. That's spiritualliving.org or eastwestbookshop.com. And also you can find her at jeanhouston.com. Now, Jean, before the break, you were talking about taking people back and maybe over just a mere 10 minutes and helping them to shift something from their past. And then people are actually, you know, who were involved remembering it differently. Do you believe in uh, parallel realities? Well, it's it's not important whether I believe it or not, but some of the most important quantum physicists of our time believe in it, including Einstein, Uh (laughs) right? who I knew, by the way, as a child. I met when I was eight years old. Did you really? Yeah, he was very sweet. Uh, I went to one of those schools that took us to meet the great elders of the time, and uh, we were trotted across the river to Princeton because we were Mm -hmm. in that school. And he was sweet. He was a little vague, you know, uh, had a lot of hair. He had on a blue sock and a red sock. Uh-huh. You know? <laughs> and one of our smart aleck kids asked him, Mr. Einstein, how can we get to be as smart as you? Uh-huh. And he said, oh, read fairy tales. We didn't like that answer at all. <laughs> so another smart aleck kid said, well, Mr. Einstein, how can we be smarter than you? He said, read more fairy tales, by which he meant imagination. Uh-huh. And he himself said imagination was the major quality of his life that drove him to do and think the ways he did. Yes. But uh, quantum physics, quantum mechanics, insists that we do, in fact, live in parallel realities. It's as if the great source itself, consciousness itself, requires that we have different kinds of experiences within the structure of our particular personalities. Uh-huh. So I've been working, you know, I've, this is the first time publicly that I've actually talked about it, but I've done it a lot. Well, we're, we're honored then to be hearing it for the first time publicly. Well, I, the, the thing is, uh, so, for example, I have a student who, named Jennifer who uh, had a, the worst kind of Lyme tick disease, uh-huh. the worst kind, the kind that's going to kill her very shortly, you know, and regular medical things was not working. So I said, let's assume that there is a Jennifer, let's call her Jennifer, which she said, well, let's call her Jennifer 4, okay? <laughs> and Jennifer 4 is perfectly healthy and mm-hmm. does not have Lyme tick uh-huh. disease. Uh-huh. Right. Though she may have lived in an environment in which it was possible, anyway, uh, she went in. Uh, she was very good at visualization and also inner travel, if you will. Uh-huh. Right. And so she, uh, we took her to a place of Jennifer Four, who she met. They had a nice conversation. They they liked each other. They were very similar in every way, except that Jennifer Four was not sick. Mm-hmm. And so what I had her do was immerse herself with the with the uh, agreement of Jennifer Four in this, uh, this realm of utter wellness. And she could actually feel herself in the immersion in the field of Jennifer Poor. Right. And she could feel all kinds of interesting things happening, click, 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 click. And uh, also learning ways, because the, they, they were much more natural, uh, natural medicine-oriented uh, than we are, you know. Anyway, by being in that immersion, when she came back, 
within a very short period of time, she was 90% free of Lyme tick disease. That's fabulous. And has remained that way. And then has continued to help others, including her own brother, to get over some really terrible things that were wrong with him. Uh-huh. But the, I, I've seen this happen so often that that now whether you say it's it's a a mind game, uh-huh. you know, I, right. my husband and I wrote that famous book, Mind Games, uh-huh. but or whether it is something, but people have a profound sense of being in the an, a kind of affinity resonance with someone who is may have a different talent, a different quality, or mm-hmm. even a different state of health. So, for example, they may pick up a quality that they have always wanted, say music or, in one case, stonemasonry, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they come back and, of course, they can then pursue this quality, this skill set, uh, and it, it happens to come upon them that's when they study it much more quickly than they would normally have had. Right, and that's so exciting. Yeah. It's like tuning into the vibration, and so you're, you know, 80% well, of the way there it, that it, way. It, it, it's attunement, yes, but it's also actually receiving something of the essence of the, the quality that they thought that they lacked here when they uh-huh. pick up that essence. And then uh, either whether it's for a form of wellness or, as I say, a skill set, it happens very quickly. Um, this is really exciting on the individual level. Yes. How do we do this collectively? Well, that's the big issue. That's what I think our friend in McTaggart in the book that's coming out in, uh, in September 26th, Power of Faith, also talks about. Uh-huh. Uh, in terms of, in this case, she's working essentially with healing. But it could also work with, uh, and she has herself had groups of collective intention to focus on places of where there was, you know, considerable war, particularly in this case with her in Sri Lanka. Uh-huh. And you do see it's not that you get better peace, but you do have a release of the the war, the the war mindedness and the war mongering. Right. We need to do a lot of that in our present world, <laughs> in other situations. So. We do. And how important is it that we have our own inner difficulties cleared in order to show up more fully, um, or does it does it matter? Well, I think it, it's it's important that if, if you're particularly in a group, this is where the group is so important, it's like the Buddhist Sangha, you know. When you are in a group that is an affinity group for a certain quality of peacefulness or consciousness or knowing that there is an, something that I've been working on, an optimal template for each of us. I'm an old Greek scholar, you know, an uh-huh. old, old Platonist. And Plato, of course, talked about the eidos or the ideal idea or image or structure in the universe for everything. Right. And so one can also tune, attune to the ideal optimal structure, mm-hmm. the higher aspect of one's beingness that one believes. If belief, belief structures reality, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then you begin to tune and attune to the more optimal template of one's being. So and things do shift and change, but you have to believe it. Do you do think the work. Work, it, it isn't just a... Uh, you know, success suggestion. This is mm-hmm. this is the really dealing with the primordial nature of consciousness itself. I wrote a book uh, with uh, Irvin Laszlo and and Larry Dossey about this. Mm-hmm. You know, called What Is Consciousness? And we talk about in that book. I talk about just how ways and various things that I've been able to do with people, but it involves the fact that you do accept that consciousness has holds for us the forms, the formulas the patterns for our own uh, evolutionary growth and and excellence. Mm, And perhaps we don't even understand exactly what that is, so it's not like we have to have all the details worked out in order to um, align with it and receive it. Yes, sir. Well, I'm going to be teaching some of these things in uh, in the the seminar we're doing. Great, and I'm going to mention the details about that again here in Seattle. (laughs) September 15th, Friday evening. Uh, from 7 to 9 at the Center for Spiritual Living, Birthing a New Humanity, and September 16th and 17th over the weekend, 9 to 5 on Saturday, one thirty to 5.30, uh, bringing the Holy to Life weekend. If you're in Seattle, you don't want to miss it, I will be there. Um, you can get tickets with spiritualliving.org or eastwestbookshop.com, and of course you can find the information on jeanhouston.com, J-E-A-N-H-O-U-S-T-O-N.com. Jean, this has been such a joy to have you here, and um, thank you for joining us. 
thank you in particular for doing this work and, and helping so many around the world create this global movement. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure to be with you and with your many, many friends out there in the ethereum <laughs> of the radio world. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us here today. I look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye, everybody. You've been listening to The Christine Upchurch Show, stellar conversations to illuminate your journey. Each week, this show engages some of the most outstanding visionaries on the planet in lively dialogue to inspire you to become that bright light you're meant to be. Join Christine every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time on KKNW, AM 1150, and TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information about the transformative healing work of Christine, visit www.StellarReflections.com. And for weekly topics, visit www.TransformationTalkRadio.com. 